right, y'all doing good? I <laughs> love right back at you. Praise God, it's good to see your beautiful faces, especially good to see Ailey and Abby back from Tennessee. All right, good. We got you back. Was it close? No tornadoes. No tornadoes. <laughs> That's always good. All right, uh, I'd like to have one more word of prayer. I have a niece, uh, Kristen, and she lives in Hawaii, my, my brother's daughter. And uh, her husband's name is Rich. And uh, this past week, uh, he fell into a diabetic coma. And uh, he's been in the hospital for a whole week, and it's not looking good. So uh, can we pray for them? Father, it's in Jesus' name, Lord, that I lift up before you, Kristen, her children. and Most of all, Lord, I lift up Rich before you. And Lord, you uh, certainly can reach anybody at any time, and you can touch their hearts and comfort them. And I pray, Father, that you, by your Holy Spirit, would speak to Rich's spirit, Lord. Pray, Father, uh, for healing. Pray for comfort, Lord, for, for everyone in the family. Just show your mercy, Father. And show your grace in this situation. For we pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. That diabetes is nothing to mess around with, is it? Very, very careful. All right, please then open your Bibles to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 16. And today we will be looking into verses 17 through 20. And I'm calling this teaching, Locking in the Truth. Locking in the Truth. Last week, uh, as we began Romans chapter 16, if you'll remember, it was a whole list of names. And it is one of those basically overlooked chapters in the uh, book of, in the Bible, actually, because it's just a bunch of names if you go, now what's that all about? But last week we were able to pick out names and talk about what, what they have done in the church and how valuable each one of them were. Now, I have a little quiz. Can anybody remember three of the names that, uh, that I picked out from last week and I said, be these people? Oh, Phoebe. Excellent. She's one because she had a servant's heart and she was a helper. That's absolutely right. Can you remember another one? Huh? Oh, Philologus. And why do we like Philologus? Because his name means lover of the word. And there was one other one, and his name is Rufus. And Rufus we used as a point of hospitality because he had apparently spent a lot of time, Paul the Apostle had spent a lot of time with him and his family and to the point where uh, Paul the Apostle said, uh, the mother of Rufus has, is also my mother. And, and everybody likes to be have some motherly love about them for sure. So uh, uh, what I liked about the first part of Romans 16 is that we saw a different side of the Apostle Paul. I called it a backstage pass uh, to the Apostle Paul. Uh, where he wasn't so much like giving theology and this is the way it is and and uh, being bold and moving forward. and Instead, he was talking to a bunch of friends. So he not only was a champion of the gospel, but he also had a lot of friends. And as I look at this chapter 16, I actually break it into four parts. So the first part, which we covered last week, was a special greeting He's writing in Corinth, he's writing to Rome, and he lists all the names of the people that he had previously worked with that are now in the church of Rome. So just name them one right after another. That's the first part, a greeting to them. The second part, which we're going to look today, is a warning. Warning of things and people to be wary of. And then next week, I hopefully we'll take parts three and four, Part three is he's going to give another greeting. <laughs> and this greeting comes from the people that are with him in Corinth. And he's sending hellos to those people who are from all of the group that's with him to all of those that are in Rome. I call it, he gets by with a little help from his friends. And then the last part of it is a beautiful blessing, encouraging words that are called a doxology. So Lord willing, we'll cover those last two parts uh, 
Maybe not this week, next week, but the week after. We got something special for next week. So we could see here in this chapter that Paul the Apostle uh, was also a friend maker, as each one of us should be. In fact, the Bible says, uh, in order to have friends, be a friend. <laughs> That's how that works. And he was more than willing to share, uh, well, here's what. If you really love somebody, if you care for somebody, won't you be willing to share a warning to them if you see trouble up ahead? There's trouble in the road, you know. Uh, this is going to hurt, you know. I remember uh, I've had a couple of occasions uh, in as being a pastor over the years in counseling people, and I've thought to myself sometimes, uh, if you continue along this lines, it's really going to hurt. So it, it is a good friend. It is a blessing when you say, uh, there's a bump in the road, please watch out for it. I further thought to myself in that first part of Romans 16 that I could pull out some of those names and I could put your names in. And I could do that because I've seen your service to the Lord and I've seen your acts of kindness and loving uh, to each other. You're willing to prefer uh, other people above yourself. And I thought, well, I could just put your names in there as well. So what I did, I was, I was encouraged myself by the Apostle Paul to perhaps find some verses where I could share them with, with you, the church family, those of you online as well. From me <laughs> to you, this is how I feel about our church family. It's taken from Philippians chapter 1, and it starts in verse 3. This is how I feel. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's my parson to person to each one of you. Now, uh, further than that, I would say that this is kind of the tenor of Romans chapter 16. I, I know it. I know it almost seems like, well, at the end of chapter 15, Paul ends the letter. Grace be to you all, amen, you know. Then he does another ending where he says, you know, the churches greet you, God bless you, you know. It's almost like he's sitting there and he's like, wait, one more thing. Wait, just, just one, I want to add one extra thing. So he keeps having these add-ons here. But, but what's fascinating to me is this particular add-on, these four verses, uh, they pack quite a punch. So uh, hang on to your hats, put on your seatbelts. These are very strong verses. Um, uh, yeah, he just keeps saying there's one more thing I need to add. As I studied it and prayed about it and thought about it, I thought, well, what's the Apostle Paul doing? And what I thought what he's doing is he has given us all these teachings, and now he kind of wants to put a lock and key on it. He wants to lock up and make firm this. Don't move from this. Just like each one of us, when we have something precious, what do we do? We keep it safe, don't we? We lock it up. We, uh, you know, we have something that we have a value, uh, we protect it. So I see Paul the Apostle coming in after the whole of the book of Romans, and he's saying, now lock this up. Lock it in. This is important. Uh, again, uh, I was thinking of who's really good at giving warnings, because this is definitely a warning. And uh, the first person I thought of with great love is my mom. Uh, how about you guys? <laughs> Moms are really good at giving warnings, aren't they? Sometimes wives are pretty good at giving warnings, too, I've noticed. <laughs> Don't you dare! No. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think moms are good at giving warnings because they love so much, and they so much want to keep us out of trouble that they are willing to warn us. Like moms say things like, uh, you know, put on your coat, it's cold outside, Right? Uh, be sure and eat your veggies. Uh, don't stay out too late. Uh, careful uh, on the road. Careful the friends you choose. 
And remember, birds of a feather flock together. Has anybody ever heard that one? All right, my mom gave me that one too. In fact, one time my mom said to me, I was in high school, and she said, she said, uh, uh, you don't have to tell me who you are. Tell me who your friends are, and I'll tell you who you are. Anybody ever heard that one? <laughs> That's absolutely true, isn't it? So be careful who your friends are. I've always been very careful in my life who my friends are. That's why you are my friends. The Apostle Paul is uh, also a very good warner. Let's call him that. And the warnings that he gives really are to save us from spiritual shipwreck, uh, to, keep us, uh, to keep us alive spiritually, to keep us full of love and joy spiritually, to keep us on the right path, because it's easy to get distracted from the things of God. It's easy to drift. Am I the only one who knows that? It's easy to drift away from the things of God. So you have to always rein yourself back in, and that's what he's trying to do as well here. To steer clear of those things that will break hearts, break lives, take us off course sometimes for a number of years. The whole of the Bible could be looked at not only as the greatest love story ever told, the love of God for you and for me, but it can also be referred to as the book of precious warnings. So please follow along now as I read Romans chapter 16, verses 17 through 20. Paul the Apostle writes, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. The word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we stop now and pause and want to be able to take in, to digest your word in such a manner that we're able to live it out daily. I pray, Heavenly Father, that the strong words that you have sent to us here through Paul and by the Holy Spirit would have an effect on us of blessing our lives. Lord, I ask that you would help me to get out of the way, that Holy Spirit, you would be the teacher, that these words, we would not only be looking into them, but we would recognize that your word is looking into us. And I pray this in Jesus' wonderful name, and the whole church family says, amen. So here's Paul's lock and key. This is what it is. You have been delivered with something of extreme preciousness, something that the world doesn't have, something that the majority of the world doesn't understand, and it has been given to us as a gift from God. So he is very much wanting to bring in words that will let you know you need to protect the truth you've been given. So clearly in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul has given to us that we all need a Savior. There's not a person alive or has ever been alive or ever will be alive that doesn't need a Savior. We're all born in a fallen world. And in this fallen world, we've all sinned. Yikes. And the wages of sin is death. <laughs> But the gift of God is eternal life. And so that has been given to us in such a clear uh, and concise manner. In fact, I want to challenge you again. Now that you've gone through the book of Romans, why don't you, in your time of devotions, start from the beginning and read the book of Romans straight through, especially with all the input that you've had 
over the last several months. <laughs> I don't know how long we've been in the Book of Romans, but it's been a good chunk of time and, and well-needed time. He goes on to say that the forgiveness of sins that we are given is not based on anything we can do, anything we could earn, anything we could merit, any effort that you could make is not good enough to knock on the pearly gates of heaven when you die and say, open up and let me in, I've been good. Nobody's been good. In fact, even in the book of Romans, we're told there's none good. No, not one. So we're all in trouble. We need forgiveness. And that forgiveness, we find out, comes as a gift. And that gift was given to us by Jesus Christ, who paid the price of your sins on the cross of Calvary. And not only that, but three days later, he rose from the dead in victory over Satan. And his resurrection then becomes our resurrection. That's a promise given and a promise kept by the Lord. We'll be with him. Now, we're being warned, and he has two targets in mind. The two targets that could possibly take us away from the truth that's been given to us in the book of Romans are, he calls, dividers and deceivers. Now, I wonder who inspires dividers and deceivers? Well, for one thing, for sure, isn't Satan called the, the he's the deceiver, right? That's his, that's his name, that's his title, that's what he does. So definitely there's some demonic uh, inspiration to lead you, to lead me away from the things of God. So those who through their influence would lead people away from the understandings and the doctrines given to us in the book of Romans, to lead us away from the gospel. And listen, much greater than that, to lead us away from Jesus Christ himself. Have you had those periods of time in your life Maybe you're going through that right now where Jesus is just closer than a brother. It's almost like you, you look around and you're just seeing Jesus and things. You're in the car drive and you just know Jesus is with you. Something happens and you're just like, oh, I want to pull Jesus into that. Have you had those times in your life? Maybe even right now. And just as often, sometimes we'll have those times when we go, oh my goodness, where where did Jesus go? And then we come to find out Jesus doesn't go anywhere. If somebody moved, who was it? It was us. <laughs> God doesn't move. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so wonderfully, God is always ready to call us right back into this close communion and fellowship with him. And so Paul uses these words. He says, I urge you. I think he says that because he wants us to understand the significance of this warning. He wants us to know this is no light matter, church family. Let's look at verse 17 and let's just travel through these, shall we? Verse 17 says, now I urge you. Somebody give me another word for urge. Beg. Huh? I'm giving you a warning. I implore, I beseech you. So don't just think of this as just being me reading Paul's words, but I want you to picture the Lord or the Holy Spirit whispering in your ear, I'm begging you. Please pay attention to this. This is a significant warning. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses. Uh, it says take note of them. So if you're with somebody and they're causing divisions or uh, divisions or offenses, then what I want you to do is just pull out a scrap piece of paper and write down. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> Divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine. Let me give you another word for doctrine. The teaching, the word of God, what you have learned so far. If you have somebody coming to you and wanting you to follow something that is apart from that, different from it, lead you away from the truths in it, contrary to the doctrines which you learned, and avoid them. Now, it's interesting that the Bible gives us all kinds of encouragements for unity, right? Unity of the Spirit, 
unity and fellowship. <laughs> fellowship, the word is taken from a word that means oneness. So we're given all these encouragements for unity. Jesus prayed for unity. You know, after the last supper, Father, make them one like we are one. So that's important. But guess what? Here is a place in the Bible where it's saying divine. We're supposed to have unity, but in this one place, it says you are to divide. Here is your permission to divide. Sound doctrine is important. The truth is important. The truth is what sets us free. And don't you ever leave it. I hope if you ever think about that, you'll hear my voice echoing in your ear. Don't you leave the truth of the word of God. And if somebody wants to lead you in another direction, break friendship with them. How many know that sometimes you just need to break off friends, certain friends? You just know it. It's like, oh, man, you know, whenever I'm with that guy, I, I drink. Or whenever I'm with that guy, you know, I do dumb things. Or whenever I'm with them, this group here, they get off track, away from what's right and with the Lord. I need to break off with that. The Lord will bless you if you do that. This book is all about salvation. It's all about forgiveness of sin. It's about the actual, literal adoption of God, of you, into his forever family. Isn't that awesome? So anything that pulls you into that, 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 that solidifies that, that locks that in for you, go after that. Hang on to that. Determine, I'm not going to let this go. And anything that does it, kick it to the curb, <laughs> as used to be said. I have found that some folks are always, you know, finding fault. And we're talking about, you know, dividers and offenses. Some people are always finding fault, you know. Did you like the worship? Well, it was okay. The one song I've heard too many times, you know. You know, it was kind of hot that day, and they didn't have the air conditioning. on, Or they had it on too hard. Or, you know... We need better snacks afterwards. Or, you know what? I've heard him give that sermon before. <laughs> just, just always, you know, picking on something, you know? Fault finding, pointing fingers at everyone else. If you fall into that range, then I want you to know that you're not a builder-upper of the church. You're, in fact, you're the opposite of that. You're one who breaks down the church family. And certainly the Bible speaks of love as being one of the great earmarks of a child of God. So one of the ways you can tell dividers and offenders is because they don't love. They don't have the love of God in them. There's no fellowship over the things of God. They're, they're not ready to speak up for Jesus or their love for them or, or really have a a meaty desire to know the word of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is called the love chapter, I know that many of you are familiar with that chapter. We find that Paul the Apostle says, if I understood all doctrine, just I just know it inside and out. There's just no part of doctrine that I don't know. If I understood all doctrine in the Bible and if I know all mysteries of the world, I just got them. I know them all. Ask me. But if I don't have love, what does it mean? It means nothing. It adds up to nothing. It's worth nothing. So be careful of those without God's love in their heart. And very pointedly, he says, take note of them, which means identify them be discerning you need to be able to ask for discernment it is a gift of the holy spirit and that gift of discernment is that ability to to hear something or to see an activity and for you to be able to say and discern oh that's from god or oh that's not from god that's discernment of spirits and the Holy Spirit will grant that to you if you pray for it. And you line up everything against the word of God. This appeal to loyalty, 
which really this is as well as a warning. It's an appeal to loyalty to God, to loyalty to his word, to the teachings of his word. I want you to understand this. This is not like an appeal to loyalty to me or loyalty to this fellowship or loyalty to anybody else. It is really an appeal of loyalty to God. Have your loyalty to God. Have your loyalty to his word. And then as you do, you will find yourself in communion and fellowship with other people who do as well. So when it comes to the word of God, even though this is a old uh, tried and true saying, when it comes to the word of God, walk the straight and narrow. Would you do that? When it comes to the word of God, walk the straight and narrow. We do not add to the word of God. We do not take away from the word of God. As a matter of fact, there's a scripture in the book of Revelation that says, if you add to the word of God, or if you take away from the word of God, then the plagues that are in this book will be added to you. You don't want that, do you? I don't want no part of that one. <clears throat> Jesus said, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many go that way. Narrow is the path that leads to eternal life. Strive to enter in through the narrow gate. That means I need to know which things to say yes to and what things to say no to in my life in order to walk that straight and narrow in my loyalty to God and my loyalty to his word. So keep your eyes peeled, church family, for those who would foul up your faith and love for God to move you away from adherence to his life-giving word. You know, the very fact that this warning is here tells me that God loves me. The fact that the warning is here means to us that God wants the very best for us. God wants to bless you. It, I, I don't think there's ever, uh, you know, a case where you need to be saying, oh, God, please bless me. Oh, God, here's your chance to, oh, please, 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 God, bless me. I don't think it works that way. That's not what I've seen in the word or in my life. Instead, what I see is God waiting for the opportunity to bless you. Oh, I just want to bless you. Oh, I just want to give to you my love. But guess what? God does not bless sin. He can't. How could God bless sin? You know, that would be like the, you know, the bank robber who's saying, you know, God bless my getaway. You know? <laughs> well, it, it doesn't make any sense, does it? It just doesn't make any sense. But if it's like, Lord Jesus, I love you. I love being with you. I love walking with you. Oh, Lord. Let your blessings just fall on me like rain. That's the idea. That's how God works. He wants to bless you. He gives you warnings because he wants to bless you. Look, in our, in our, we're in a culture. We're living a time in the culture where it's like anything goes. Am I right? I don't know if you've seen these, but somebody just sent me another one. <laughs> where there's these school board meetings where somebody would get up in front of the school board, grade school, and read the books that are being given to children. And it's flat out, full on, straight on pornography. I don't know, have you seen any of these? And they'll begin to read it. And everybody that's on the school board freaks out. We'll have none of that in here. Stop that reading right now. Uh, officer, come and take this guy, and they'll haul the guy away. And these are the books that these guys have approved. It, it makes literally no sense to me whatsoever to hypersexualize children is asking for trouble. We're living in a culture where anything goes. I don't know if you notice all the music videos lately or all the concerts where it's flat out openly praise of Satan. You seen any of those? It's like just, they're just like going for it. 
don't know if you've seen a lot of mocking of God lately. Good. Luck on that one. <laughs> that won't stand for long. Not for a group, not for an individual. God have mercy on us and God forgive us. In our anything goes culture, church family, I want you to know there is indeed right and wrong. There is indeed good and bad. There is indeed false and true. Where do you lie? What side of the rope do you fall on? And have you locked yourself in with this understanding? Have you made that conscious decision to be loyal to God, to be loyal to his word? So keep your eyes peeled, church family. Don't let anybody foul up your faith. Remember back uh, in our study through the uh, book of uh, Acts. And the second half of it is really speaking a lot to Paul the Apostle and the things that he went through in order to promote the gospel. So don't always think that it's going to be easy to promote the gospel, yet do it anyway, right? But here's what he said to the church of Ephesus. New Living Translation, Acts chapter 20, starting in verse 28. He writes, so guard yourselves. You ever thought about guarding yourself? There's so many influences in the world. You need to guard yourself. And God's people guard each other. Feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, purchased with his own blood, over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as leaders. I know that false teachers, like vicious wolves, will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. Watch out. Remember the three years I was with you, my constant watch and care over you night and day, and my many tears for you. These verses are heavy, aren't they? When you just really let them sink in. And then you think, well, how casual do I take things that come my way? You know, what am I willing to watch on TikTok or YouTube or, you know? What do I let just drift into my eye gate or drift into my ear gate? What things do I not take a second thought about? I need to be careful. Paul knew that faith in God could be made into something that faith was never intended to be. We have a whole history of that, don't we? We have a whole litany of cult, cults and false teachers and teachings. Church family, stick to the word of God. Our Lord Jesus even said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. <laughs> That's an interesting picture, isn't it? But inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. Somebody can come to you looking sugarly sweet. But if it's apart from the word of God, if it's apart from what you have been taught, that person is not a tender sheep, but a ravenous wolf. Let your judgments be made by the word of God. Look at verse 18 in Romans chapter 16. For those who are such do not serve the Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. There's some big clues here for us. Two that really jump out to me. The first one is, they're not servants. They're not looking to serve Jesus, and they're not looking to serve the church family. And the second thing that jumps right out to me is who it is that falls prey to false teachings and false teachers. And that, he uses the word simple. Don't be simple-minded when it comes to the word of God. Dig in. Understand the word of God for yourself. Be discerning. We've already talked about that. 
Big clues here. Instead, Paul says, they serve their own belly. What, what interesting terminology he uses, right? This is somebody who's entirely self-focused in what they have to share regarding faith in God. They're looking for personal gain by what they're sharing. They're looking for personal fame by what they do within the family of God. They are looking for personal followers. Hey, you don't need to be at that church learning the Bible. That's old school. <laughs> Come over to my place. Let me show you what I've got. This is really outstanding. This is cutting edge. Don't fall for that. That's somebody speaking for their own belly. They would be what Jesus has called hirelings. They're just part-timers over the flock. They are not those that are willing to lay down their life for the flock. He says them by smooth words, flattering speech. They deceive the hearts of the simple. Here's what I saw. So I was thinking, what else does this sound like? Or what else have I heard uh, from false teachers? Things along these lines. You know, I know what the Bible says, but come on, does it really mean that? Or how about this one? You know, I, I really think that there might be some understand, misunderstandings in regards to the original Greek and Hebrew. And not only that, but that was for those times in the first century. We're living in a different time now. <laughs> I would say, yeah, we're living in a different time. The more we need the first century teaching of the church is now more than ever before. Because as I've already pointed out, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This would be uh, those teaching what the Bible calls another gospel. And that, interestingly enough, uh, Pastor Daniel taught that here on Wednesday uh, from the book of Galatians, uh, chapter 1. And uh, the writing said, uh, if somebody comes to you preaching another gospel or preaching another Jesus, then you've already received, let that person be accursed. He said, even if I did that, let me be accursed. Bible commentator Newell, in exasperation, wrote the following. Infectious diseases are quarantined, but evil teachers who would divide to their destruction and draw away the saints with teaching contrary to the doctrine of Christ and the apostles are everywhere tolerated. <laughs> I can just hear him spitting. <laughs> And so we have dedicated ourselves here in this church family to be Bible students. We're not just Bible students. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. That's who we are. Personally, I am ever the Bible student and sometimes the Bible teacher. Now, this part about being simple kept running that over in my mind uh, if you want to know the real thing uh, you don't need to spend a lot of time studying what's what's fake you need to spend all your time studying what's authentic so when they have these uh, FBI agents uh, who uh, can identify counterfeit money they don't study the counterfeit <laughs> They study real money, what it feels like, what it looks like, holding up to light, all the little differences that, and so that they know the, the authentic uh, money, as long as we'll have it, <laughs> as uh, good as they can. But when it comes to what's counterfeit, they know instantly, oh, I can tell by the feel, that's not real. That's us, that we know the Lord Jesus and walk with him that we really are students of his word, disciples of his, that when something fake comes along, something inside of you will go, mm, that's not quite right. Uh, two weeks ago, I had a call from somebody that moved from our church and ended up in Arizona. 
And uh, she says to me, uh, we're having a really hard time uh, finding a church. There was one church that we thought would be right for us because I really loved the worship. So we went like three times to this uh, one church. Uh, and then she says to me, but you know what? They never opened the Bible. And she was like, how could a church do that? How can a church not study the Bible? That's my big question. <laughs> I don't know how that happens. So she says, so we're moving on. We're going to find one. But I love it that it was somebody that was with us and had been taught chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Here's what God's word says so that when you hear something that's not God's word, an alarm bell goes off inside. That's not right. Or you hear something that is from God's word, you go, that's right on. That I need to take in. So the Apostle Paul has no problem telling us what course of action to take when we come across what's false. He says two things, mark and avoid. That's the plan right there. Uh, I've got some strong words from Jude. Jude is a half-brother of Jesus, son, uh, a son of Mary and Joseph. And uh, here's what Jude wrote. Now, again, this is... This is wild as far as I'm concerned. Jude chapter 1, starting in verse 12, he writes, These, the false teachers, or those that would pull you away, or those that would divide, these are spots in your love feast. While they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves, they are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, Late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by their roots, raging waves of sea, foaming up in their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. It's just, it's just, it's hot touching the page on that word, you know. <laughs> But again, there's so much validity to it that you need to protect yourself, to guard yourself, to guard the church family, to not be simple when it comes to the word of God. Listen, disciples of Jesus, test everything and cling to what is good. Verse 19, for your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. The church family in Rome had a wonderful uh, reputation. They are probably, you know, I think I've mentioned this already, they're given the, you know, the greatest compliments to a church, seems to me, to be given to the church at Rome. They were right on, you know, and, and Paul is just, thrilled with them, and he tells them that they are obedient. What are they obedient to? They're obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. And so if something comes along false, they go, I'm not going to obey that. You know, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to hang that flag in our church. I'm going to stick to the word of God. I then began to think and to question, you know, what's the key to this, you know? What, what is it that I need to, to pull from this and, and to really make it a part of, of who I am? And I thought to myself, the underlying key, I believe, seems to be what are the things that occupy your thinking? What, what are the things that take up space uh, in your mind? Uh, what do you constantly think about? Here's another way to put it. On what things do you place your affections? <coughs> Are you thinking about the word of God? You place your heart and mind on the word of God? Is the Lord Jesus himself your great affection? That will keep you safe. 
Here's something that goes along the lines of that. It's Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 8. And I know it's a favorite of some folks. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And as I look at this, I think to myself, guess what? Jesus is true. Jesus is noble. Jesus is just. Jesus is pure. Jesus is lovely. Jesus is of good report. He's of virtue. He is totally praiseworthy. I need to keep my mind on Jesus. <laughs> That'll guard you. That'll keep you out of trouble. So uh, let's go on. Verse 20. Now, if I do this, what we just taught right here, and if I cling to the truths of the gospel of grace in Romans chapter, the whole of the book, it says, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. That tells me right there that he's the author of divisions and offenses. You know? He's the deceiver. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. I wish it would be soonly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. These, you know, church, it won't always be a struggle. It won't always be so hard. There are things in life that come at us from every which direction. And it won't always be that way. There are things that cause us great sorrows, heartaches, and pains, and things that we feel at times are too much for us to deal with. Church family, that will not always be the case. Jesus has given us great and precious promises regarding his return. And he's coming back for you, and he's coming back for me, and those who love the gospel of grace. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 12, we read the following. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. And that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Whew. I need that day. I want that day to come. It's coming for you and for me. You know what I think one of the big, uh, you know, I think when we get to heaven, there'll be a lot of oohs and ahs, <laughs> for sure. But I think one of the big things that will happen when we get to heaven one of the big statements will be, that this is what I think. We'll get to heaven, we'll go, oh, now I get it. <laughs> now I get it. Now I see. Oh, for sure. But now we walk in faith. We live by faith. Everything we do is by faith in the Son of God who loves us and who gave himself for us. We're getting close to that day. Jesus also said that the tares and the wheat, the true and the false, they grow up together, don't they? And you can't tell the difference between sometimes what is a tear and what is a wheat until that day when they all stand before Jesus. False teachings will come, church family, and false teachings will go. You stick hard and fast to the word of God and obedience to him. I want you to notice that God does the crushing, and then he puts Satan under our feet. The verse ends beautifully with, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this evening and for my beautiful, wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ. I thank you, Father, that you have made us here to be lovers of your word 
philologus, lovers of the word and disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, that your blessings would fall on us like a fresh rain, that we would sense your nearness and dearness, perhaps like never before. We love you, Lord. We love you dearly because you first loved us. We pray this in Jesus' precious name and the whole church family says, amen. Let's all stand up.